First, I just want to say thank you very, very much for offering to do this. The first question is, can you introduce yourself to people who don't know who you are? Yes, George Miley. I uh, always wanted to go into science engineering based on my father's work in the field. He worked as a chemical construction engineer, and I was raised in Petrolia, Pennsylvania, where he went to work on construction of an oil refinery and then stayed on as one of the the managers of the refinery. Did my undergraduate work at the Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. It was called Carnegie Tech. Went to University of Michigan and majored in nuclear engineering. Graduated, worked several years for uh, General Electric in Schenectady, New York. Actually at the Knowles Atomic Power Lab where they did work on nuclear submarines. Then I did a tour in the uh, Army due to my having been in ROTC. And after that, came back, worked a little longer at GE, and then became professor, actually assistant professor of nuclear engineering, University of Illinois in 1961. I had a 50-year career at the University of Illinois doing teaching and research, and I enjoyed both. Now, during this career, I tended to focus on fusion. In fact, when I came there, I later became the director of the Fusion Studies Lab at the University of Illinois, and so was very heavily involved in I think my career is I'm most proud of is the many students that I have supervised over those years, about 56 PhD students and a number of master's students. And many of those worked in fusion, but not all, since I did a variety of things and actually put a plug in for a, a book I wrote, which is published by World Scientific about technologists searching for a black swan. I wrote this book when I had a retirement ceremony at the university in 2010. And and students coming back were asking me, well, why did I cover so many different topics in my research? I tried to explain that in this book. I did work on various things, but I felt that they all had to do with ultimately the subject of new energy. And fusion, in my mind, is one of the most important new energies that we can develop. So that's what I've focused on. The first topic that I think we should talk about is nuclear-powered lasers. Can you talk a little bit about what they are and your work in them? Yes. I became extremely interested in, you said nuclear-powered lasers, I call them nuclear-pumped lasers. Actually, it's interesting. I went to a faculty summer school in Idaho at the National Rack test site, but to get to the lab where I was working from Idaho Falls, I had to take a government bus, which went out to the desert for about two hours, and many people played cards or did something else. I was reading a book about the invention of the laser, which had only occurred a year or so before that, and lasers laze because you put a lot of energy into the lasing media, mostly done by putting electrical energy in. My thought was, well, why not nuclear energy? And so when I got back to the university after that, I began trying to do that. Now, the way I was doing it and the way it's mainly done today is by using a neutron source, such as a fission reactor, not a fusion, but a fission reactor, which produces neutrons. A neutron acts with boron, produces products, the main one being an alpha particle, which comes out, and that can provide energy input to the lasing media. And so it works like an electrical laser, only use nuclear energy. And the remarkable thing about it would be this alpha particle has a different energy, and so it can excite different energy states in a normal electrical laser. In addition, if you design a reactor around a lasing media, let's say some type of gas that lases, you can get a tremendous amount of energy in this way, and so it could be a remarkably large laser. And my interest, I view this as a fundamental energy conversion mechanism, and, and I wasn't thinking of it as being such a large laser, but later as things turned out, this type of laser could be a weapon in, in the Star Wars era when we were competing with Russia. Russia was working on these types of lasers. We started a secret program in the U.S. also, and that was a weapon, a laser weapon, and it doesn't take too much imagination to think of what you could do with such a thing. So I became quite involved with Russians that were working on this, and if, uh, if anyone has an interest in that, they could take a look at uh, a book which I finally published with Russian colleagues who had been working on it at the uh, secret cities in Siberia. 
they invest a lot of money in the studies. And this book is published by Springer and called Lasers with Nuclear Pumping. And once the Cold War ended, work in this in the U.S. stopped essentially because the interest in the development ceased to be something of interest by the military. But the work is continued in Russia and still continues. So I, I predict these nuclear pump lasers are going to be a thing in the future. I have not thought of them, though, still as, as a weapon, but more as a way of transporting energy in space. Incidentally, with a fusion reactor, an even more exciting possibility is you can use the plasma itself to pump a laser and have a fusion pump laser. So that field would produce something very exciting. We need a number of forms of energy and conversion to light from a fusion plasma is an exciting opportunity, as is conversion to electricity. The issue of information secrecy comes up in dealing with the Russians regarding this. And I was hoping you could talk about your thoughts about information secrecy when it comes to fusion. We often see people that come up with ideas for fusion reactors, and they get very secretive and protective, and they want to hide what they've done. Do you have any thoughts on sharing versus hiding back information related to fusion? Well, I'm sure everyone who thinks about this will come up with concerns about it, but the secrecy in the nuclear pump laser area was all due to and continues to be due to concerns that weapons development. And that's a different type of secrecy from people in that fusion area who in more recent years have obtain private funding to develop a, a certain type of proposed fusion reactor. If you are going to invest a lot of money into something, you need to have patents and you maybe need to have secrecy until you can get to the point where you can start recouping your money. And this is the uh, capitalistic way of developing things. Unfortunately, it retards the development of the field. Because uh, government support, which allows this information to be free, makes it possible for us to exchange ideas. We go to meetings, we hear what other people are doing, come home excited, try to do something that will advance what they've done. That's the way to really drive a field forward. But the problem here is that the government has become very uh, focused on certain types of fusion and doesn't allow variety and has uh, stifled the development of alternate approaches in the U.S. Consequently, private funding is the only way to do that. It's driving the field forward when the government has fallen down. And it's still so risky and it's such a long-term thing. It's still something that the government should be pushing, not necessarily individual investors. But that's where we've been left. Agree with that. I have to ask about certain people that you interacted with over your career. Do you know Dr. Motion Lubin, who founded the LLE at the University of Rochester? Absolutely. I was working on fusion here at Illinois. This was back in the early days. And I was considering a uh, sabbatical and looking around. Uh, Moshe Lubin had done some very interesting work on ion injected mirror reactor at the University of Rochester. And I said, that's really interesting. I contacted him, said, why don't I come and work with you in that? I think it's an interesting approach. He responded saying, well, he hated to push me off, but he was changing his approach and was proposing what developed into the laser lab there. He was posing to the uh, DOD and DOE to uh, develop a uh, large laser for uh, inertial confinement fusion. So anyway, I didn't pursue that anymore. And he sounded like he didn't think he would get the money. And I thought, well, it sounds crazy. <laughs> I don't think he'll get any money anyway. But a few years later, the project was funded at Rochester, and it was to do government nurse climate fusion work, but also to have users. It was built around the concept of a user's facility, so that people from other universities could come in and use this laser, whereas other laser facilities of comparable size, say Livermore or someplace like that, and you couldn't access it. This was a real breakthrough for people at universities. Not many people at universities were working in the area because they hadn't had an opportunity to do anything. So I was very surprised when Moshe called me one day and said he wanted to fly out and talk to me about doing some experiments there as one of the early users. So he approached me to come there 
and write a proposal. And if it would be approved by the review board that they had set up, it could get funded. And I did that. So it was funded, and actually six students uh, worked on that, many of whom are still working in the field. So we did an experiment there where we used a magnetic spectrometer, which would measure the energy of fusion products that were produced when one would implode a fusion target at the facility. And that was a very productive and really interesting time, but it was all due to OSHA's great interest in getting people to work there, like myself, and interacting with him in setting up project was great because he was one who wanted to know about the science, talk about the science, and we did. I admired him, and essentially they decided later that they needed someone who was more of a business type managing the lab than Moshe, and so he was pushed out, and then he started his own company there in Rochester to, I don't remember exactly what it was set up to do. He was creating circuits using lasers for like x-ray photography. And they passed on, but a great person. Bogdan Maglich. He's no longer with us. What was he like as a person? Because he made some very bold claims. Yeah. <laughs> First time I met him, I went to a meeting in Austria, and he was there. He always made bold claims. You know, he was talking about the Enigma. His approach to fusion was to have colliding beams. It's hard to describe how slides, but he had a bunch of beams coming around in circles and all intersecting in the center with each other. It was a very interesting concept, but uh, at this meeting, he gave a talk. He captivated the audience and said that he was planning to set up a company and create one of his devices next to Austria and Poland. And the next day when we were going to the meeting, some people were picketing out in front of the meeting place. They thought it was a fission reactor he was talking about. Didn't want one of those things in Poland. Anyway, he was very flamboyant. So that was my introduction to him. Later, I got to know him somewhat better because he had support for his MIGMA work from the Air Force. And I was a member of the Air Force Review Committee, which reviewed researches being done by the Air Force laboratories and also contractors. And since I was one that knew something about fusion on the committee, I was tagged with the problem of reviewing his work at Princeton on this Bigma. And it's a remarkable concept, but getting too much into the physics of it, I would say that the big question is, these colliding beams they had an unstable distribution, and you worry about instabilities and problems that would prevent it from having sufficient confinement time to really fuse. And in trying to review this and get him to explain why he thought that what I just said wasn't correct for his approach was like pulling teeth. He was very hard to deal with. And at one point he called and said he was about to sue me because I was misrepresenting what he said. Anyway, later I found out that you weren't anyone unless you'd been threatened to be sued by, <laughs> by Maglish. <laughs> so I, I went ahead and didn't worry about all that. But I think that his personality was, he was one of these people who was very hard to get along with, as I've said. But he also was focused and dedicated to achieving fusion. And he's one of these people that could excite the community that's working on it and maybe push him to do something different if he uh, presented what he was doing is better than what they were doing. And so I think there's a place for people like him. The beam concept comes up again and again. And con there's a startup FP generation that had a concept like that. And there's interest now in a concept like that. There's uh, when you have two beams colliding, there's an instability that forms because of the charge distribution and they spread apart. That was, right. that was figured out by the Pope of Plasma Physics. You interacted with Norman Rostoker. Oh, uh, yes. He's kind of famous with and the Trialpha crowd. Oh, I'm Rostoker. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was thinking about taking a sabbatical, but almost at the same time, uh, Norman Rostoker called me. Now, I really didn't know him, but he was head of the Applied Physics Department at Cornell at the time, and they had this pulsed electron beam experiments that were going on, and it was their high-voltage lab, and I knew about that. And so he called me, he said that they had some great results they could accept accelerate ions to GV energies, and these ions, when they collided with a target, would produce uh, very high-energy nuclear reactions that uh, hadn't been observed before, and he wanted me to come out to study it. 
and he was going to hire me to come there. Now, my wife is at her studies at Cornell, and so when I told her that he wanted me to come there, she was all excited. We decided that would be a great place to spend the year. And I got there, and by the time I got there, he had discovered that they had made a mistake, and they had not accelerated GEV beams. The concept is that low energy Electrons passing by, ions would accelerate them, but they have to catch them in the potential well to move them forward. Something like getting someone to jump on a moving streetcar. If you don't jump properly, you don't get on. That's what was happening. So he got me there and he said, well, I could do whatever I wanted. He didn't care. <laughs> and that was a great time. <laughs> I did two things. I taught a fusion technology class in the spring. Second thing, though, was I decided to dump these relativistic electron beams into a gas such as nitrogen or neon or helium or something and see if I could make it laze. And I developed a method for doing that, and I succeeded just as I was about to leave after the year. Actually, that whole field took off after I left, not necessarily because of me, but so many people were working on it. I just happened to be lucky to be the first one to write a paper on it with the results. Norman realized what had happened. He came racing over to the house the day we were leaving and said, he wanted me to stay another year and we're working these lasers. And I said, well, I can't do that now. I've already uh, committed back home and I'm loaded into a trailer <laughs> to move back. He was a great guy. At the time, he had some very interesting prima donna people working on these relativist electron beams for fusion. For example, Hans Fleischmann was trying to produce field reverse configurations in competition with Livermore, and, but these people couldn't get along, and they were always arguing about who got what beam time on the machine and this, that, and the other. And, and Norman was very frustrated. He found himself trying to prevent these arguments. Norman was very blunt, but it was in a way that was sort of fascinating. He didn't get mad at him. <laughs> I came in one day and told him, well, you know what we need to do is we should be working on field reverse configurations for proton 411 fusion. And Norman said, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. Get out of my office. <laughs> <laughs> but later, get it up to try alpha. And basically, it was that concept. Let's improve from what I was trying to tell him about, though. All right, we got to change gears. I got to ask you technical questions. Todd Ryder in 94, he wrote that MIT thesis that said that there are fundamental limitations to a plasma and thermodynamic equilibrium. You and Louis Chacon in 2000 did some really good theory work arguing against Todd Ryder's IEC papers. Can you explain that work? Yeah, well, Ryder and Evans were both were aimed at inertial electrostatic confinement in different ways. And it's a very complex issue. Ryder tried to solve the energy reaction problems. Inside a plasma that is quasi-neutral, isotropic, bell curve in energy, and then how energy moves around from hot to cold plasma and the different rates and how long things take. The rate constants that he used were calculated assuming an equilibrium distribution, which it isn't in an equilibrium distribution. And consequently, when you recognize that and do a calculation like Chaton and I did, I should say he did the hard work. He was my student. He showed that when you took into account the proper distributions, that Ryder's work was not correct, although uh, on some limits it might be. The limiting cases are not where we want to be in order to achieve fusion. And, and Nevins was more subtle, but again, it had to do with distribution functions and equilibrium kinetics and felt that we presented a uh, counter argument to both of their arguments and consequently uh, I have a strong feeling and they have technical reasons for feeling that uh, inertial electrostatic confinement will work as a fusion system. Do you have a favorite fusion approach? There are a lot to choose from. Well, I still feel that inertial electrostatic confinement, very good approach and one that could achieve a small reactor systems and is one that, if correctly carried out, could achieve fusion early because it has the advantage of fairly cheap and small experiments so that you can progress rapidly. 
We don't have to have a huge project like either to get there. Let me back off. I think that there may be various approaches that ultimately achieve fuse, and we should be pursuing a number of approaches. I think it's happened. Most of the money has ended up going to the International Fusion Project either. It have prevented us from pursuing many alternate approaches that could develop. Back in the field of inertial confinement fusion, laser fusion, so to speak, I've done a lot of work in the recent years with Professor Heinrich Hoare from the University of New South Wales on what we call block ignition of laser fusion targets, and I feel that that has great promise too. Can you describe direct conversion to someone who's not a specialist? What problems do you think has been solved with DC, and what problems do you say remain? Let me go back and talk about this from a conceptual view. When we create a fusion plasma, which is hotter than the sun, we really have electrical charges, ions and electrons, moving at high energy. All we need to do is separate them, and we have an electrical current. So it always seemed to be sad that we would have such an amazing high-temperature plasma, which would end up just using a steam cycle to produce electrical output. So the basic question is, can you think of some ways of having direct conversion of these charged particles to electricity, bypassing the steam cycle? And if you do it that way, you aren't limited by the Carnot cycle efficiency. It's not a equilibrium thermodynamic system. It's a direct separation of the ion electron charges produce the current. And so, in principle, you can have 100% efficiency. You never get that, but to say that, that would be the limit, whereas otherwise you're limited by the temperature difference, hot and cold. And if you have a DT fusion device that's using a neutron to heat a blanket or something, you end up with temperatures that are limited by materials limitations, much like a fission reactor. And hence the conversion efficiencies may be limited to 30% or something like that. In fact, the difficulty of fission reactors was that fuel element temperature limitations caused the hot temperature in a fission reactor to be less than the hot temperature in a coal-fired reactor. <laughs> so that's sort of frustrating. They finally got around that and got higher temperature fuel elements. What have we achieved in that? Livermore and people like Ralph Moyer there were leaders in trying to develop ways of doing this. The fusion reactor that they were working on was one of the easiest to conceptualize doing something with, like I'm talking about because in the mirror, you, well, the mirror, you what you have is a magnetic bottle. You put strong magnetic fields at the end, and weakers in the center, and you have plasma in the bottle and the fusion products and the plasma ions and electrons all come out the end through the mirror field so you can get to them there. So they worked on a direct conversion method which just used electrostatic converter plate. If you use DT, the main energy carrier you're trying to convert is the alpha particle. The and tritium goes to a 14 MeV neutron and a 3.5 MeV alpha particle. You could convert the alpha particle energy by just having a plate, which is at three and a half MeV, and have it come against that plate, and you'd get a direct current at very high voltage. But that would be probably not very economical in the sense that most of energy is carried by a neutron. You have to worry about the fact that you can't use direct conversion with the neutron. A neutron will end up thermalizing a blanket, so you have to have a temperature there. So other ways of doing all this, in laser fusion, you could do this by having the expansion energy work against the magnetic field and extract energy that way. Anyway, coming back to the problem of the neutron, you not only have to have a confinement method that allows you to do this, but you also have to have a fuel that gets most of energy into the products. Unfortunately, nature has not been kind to us in this case. Of the fuels, the next most favorable would be deuterium helium-3, where you would get a lot of the energy in charged particles, but you still produce some neutrons from DD reactions. But the problem is where you get the helium-3, 
that all led to people thinking about getting from lunar mining. The other fuel has been very popular. If we can figure out how to do it, is protons on boron 11, PB11. In other words, hydrogen yeah. reaction with boron 11. And so we get alpha particles. And that's where the name tri alpha came from. And they were hoping to be able to do direct conversion from the alpha particles coming out of their fuel reverse confined device. You actually touched on two questions that I had, which was the ash problem and fusion fuels. There's people who think that we can do it all with deuterium. Do you think that's possible? Or see me, it, uh, the standard is to use DT. That's what all the national labs are focused on. I mean, you're talking about ash. If you have a say a tokamak and the alpha part is contained in the plasma itself, it's going to slow down and it'll be a plasma's around 20 kV or something fusing. The ash will be about 20 kV and the question is, will it come out in the diverter in the uh, tokamak at the same rate as the fuel so it doesn't build up? If it builds up, it dilutes the fuel and that could prevent it from performing well or even igniting. And I had actually written several papers about this where I was claiming that the alpha particle due to its double charge and the potential surfaces in the plasma, that the ash would build up. You did have a problem. Other people who were on the plasma design teams for ITER said that that was wrong, and they feel that there is not a problem. That remains to be seen once they get the thing built, <laughs> which will be a while. <laughs> I hope that they're right. but. Uh, I'm not going to say I'm wrong. <laughs> Is there anything you're working on now that you want to talk about? Well, since I retired, I'm still working and still have some students, and then I still have a small company. So let me just mention both. I could not get funding for inertial electrostatic confinement fusion development itself. So instead, what I've done is talked about using the inertial electrostatic confusion configuration for space propulsion, but it would not be powered by fusion, but it would be powered by electrical input, which would then treat the plasma, and configuration would cause the plasma to come out in a jet, which would power the fusion system. And I have a student who's working on that. We're doing experiments where we're trying to demonstrate that what I just said works. So I'm very happy about that. It's allowed us to continue to work on some of the basic physics that's related to inertial electrostatic confinement. Even if we aren't working on fusion per se, I think that our understanding of some of this physics is going to help some of our other students have used modified IEC concepts produce neutron sources. They have a company here in town, Starfire is the name of it, that's producing commercial neutron sources for various applications, such as neutron activation analysis used in coal mines or steel mills. Or The other thing I'm working on is our concept involves nanoparticles that we've milled ourselves using a cryo mill so that they have a number of defects and we purposely try to create these defects when we pressurize them, high pressure of deuterium or hydrogen, the gas condenses into these defects and forms a very high density cluster. We may have a thousand atoms of deuterium in the cluster and this cluster is so dense that it is actually superconducting at minus 70 degrees so it may confuse. So that's what we're working there with private funding. What do you think the U.S. could be doing to encourage fusion? What can we do better? This is a real difficult question to answer because I've already criticized the U.S. spending most of the money on either. On Congress, every year now, there have been some efforts to cancel our involvement in either and put money back into the domestic program, which is a real problem because people fear, and I think it's probably right, if they cancel their involvement in either, the government's going to think they don't know what they're doing. We've been telling them that that's what we should be doing, and then if we stop that program, the funding of the alternate approaches may not get any money, and so the fusion program would really be cut back. What we have to do some way is get people interested in fusion again, realize the tremendous potential it has and the need for a solution to our energy problem, which fusion can provide. We now know that we can't have one energy source. Solar and wind and all that's great, but we need a central source like fusion, which would be tremendous. 
we've got to get funding for our home program. There were a number of alternate approaches that were being pursued, and these have been cut out. Alcatraz C was closed at MIT. Uh, the fusion program at home has been devastated by the government and the Department of Energy. Some way we've got to get that back, whether it involves cutting back a little bit of the funding on ITER and adding more into this, I don't know, but there's got to be a resurgent interest in fusion that is brought about by I think people who may listen to your discussions of it and that that will help fuel the interest. They have to talk to their Congress people. We have to build up the excitement again. I ran the IEEE program on Fusion, which is in Chicago at the Palmer House Hotel. And I forget how many thousand people came. That was way back. And that was the largest meeting we had on Fusion in the U.S. At the time because that was a time when Bob Hirsch said we have to put enough money in this program that we make progress and we get fusion achieved in a reasonable time span. If we just put in a little bit of money and it keeps getting drawn out, never going to be achieved, the program will be killed. Part of the goal of this podcast is to explain fusion to the general public, as many people as possible, as simply as possible. So we'll call that the whole thing. Speaking as a member of the community, we're so fortunate to have you among us. This is a great effort, and uh, I I know it's taking so much of your time. Really appreciate it.